Thank you, uh, and I need to be sure that you're hearing me with this here. If, if um, that becomes a problem anywhere in the back, why wave your hand and I, I can't hold it. Um, it's okay now? Well, uh, I'm delighted to be here. I've, uh, uh, I grew up in another one of the um, holiness churches, uh, the Brethren in Christ, and um, so I've been a part of um, the holiness tradition um, for um, all of my life. And um, I've known of Nazarene Compassion Ministries and had a great admiration for what you do. So just uh, uh, a delight to, to be with you. And in this uh, first session, I want to take up the very non-controversial topic of thinking biblically about politics. Um, tomorrow, I'm actually going to tell you what I think about uh, this current election and uh, even go so far as to say who I think you should vote for. But uh, I'm not doing that today. Uh, I'm simply trying to uh, uh, <coughs> lay out a framework. Um, you know, in, in a good, lo good long section of the 20th century, Evangelicals were substantially apolitical. They were not involved in uh, many ways. Uh, I mean, Jerry Falwell said, um, um, back when he wouldn't even call himself an evangelical, he would have said he was a fundamentalist. But uh, when Martin Luther King was marching, he said that uh, Christians are supposed to, uh, evangelicals, um, uh, preachers are supposed to preach the gospel, and they're not supposed to do politics. But uh, in the last um, several decades, uh, in the 80s and the 90s, uh, and since then, evangelicals have become up to our ears uh, in politics. Now, just because um, you're a good Christian doesn't mean you get your politics right. I'll give you a couple illustrations of that. Uh, Jesse Helms was, um, I'm sure, a Southern Baptist, uh, the senator from North Carolina, very, very prominent pro-life person. Um, widely known and respected for uh, trying to um, uh, oppose abortion and uh, very much uh, a pro-life person. But um, he came from the largest tobacco growing state. And so he um, supported uh, and promoted government subsidies for tobacco growers. And he even uh, supported a program in which we sent US grown tobacco abroad to poor countries under our Food for Peace program not, I think, an entirely pro-life agenda. But just to be an equal opportunity critic, uh, uh, another um, uh, person that illustrates my point about uh, just because you're a Christian doesn't mean you get politics right. Miguel Escoto was a Catholic priest. Um, I, I actually knew him uh, somewhat, not, not really well, but um, he was a Nicaraguan. And uh, in the 80s, uh, when the Sandinista government um, uh, was um, running Nicaragua, uh, he became the foreign minister of Nicaragua. Um, I met with him several times. I have no doubt but that um, uh, in a substantial way he was a, a committed a Catholic Christian. But he went to the Soviet Union about 1987, just you know, a few years before it collapsed, and he gave he accepted the Lenin Peace Prize, and he gave speeches around the Soviet Union, saying that the um, Soviet Union was the last great hope for Earth. Not entirely perceptive uh, in 1987. So just because you're a, a Christian doesn't mean you get your politics right. Um, I said evangelicals um, are up to our years in in politics. Um, whether you think of Jerry Falwell's Moral Majority in the 80s, or Pat Robertson Christian Coalition in the 90s, or uh, the massive um, vote for George W. Bush um, um, in 200 and uh, 204, or today. Uh, evangelicals are clearly deeply engaged in politics. And it's not just in the US, um, uh, in Latin America, um, Africa, there were at least eight evangelical presidents in those countries in, 19, in the 1980s and 1990s. And it continues. Um, one interesting example was Frederick Chaloba of um, Zambia. He was elected president in 1991. He appointed several evangelical pastors to his cabinet. He pronounced Zambia a, quote, Christian nation. He said, I quote, I, I quote him, I submit the government uh, and the entire nation of Zambia to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Now, unfortunately, 
He also violated human rights. He tortured opponents um, in custody. He bought votes. And he allowed widespread corruption um, in the government. And uh, then when he wanted to run for a third term, which was not according to the Constitution, he really was uh, actually tear gassed people who opposed him. There's a book by Paul Freston written about this massive new evangelical engagement around uh, the developing world. And he points out that although there were some very good things that have happened, often uh, there were huge mistakes. And he says that the basic reason is that these evangelicals went from not being political to being political without any careful thinking about how you do politics in a Christian kind of way. Ed Dobson, I don't know if any of you know that name, but um, he was uh, Jerry Falwell's um, vice president, uh, both at the university and also in Moral Majority. And then he left um, uh, and became the pastor of the largest evangelical church um, in Grand Rapids. And after he had left Jerry Falwell, he wrote a book about um, his political engagement. And Dobson said, this is not James Dobson, it's Ed Dobson. And Ed Dobson said, our approach back then was ready, fire, aim. That's really not good enough, and he was making that point. Uh, the absence of any widely accepted, systematic, evangelical reflection on politics, I think, has led to the contradiction and the confusion and the ineffectiveness of evangelicals as they engaged in politics. Just one example of the inconsistency. And that is with regard to the sanctity of human life. I think almost all evangelicals, I among them, agree with the principle that every human being is inestimably precious. And so we have been very engaged, visibly, in opposition to abortion. But one joker commented that it looked as if we thought that life begins at conception and ends at birth. Because we seem to be talking about abortion as a sanctity of human life issue without noticing that smoking also kills people made in the image of God, that poverty kills people made in the image of God, uh, and so on. There's been, until the last decade or decade and a half, there was just a massive failure of evangelicals to think in any careful, systematic way about politics. Catholics were quite different. Catholics uh, had a century or more of careful reflection on politics, mainline Protestants um, likewise, but uh, evangelicals had not done it. And some people thought uh, it's too messy. Maybe especially this year, some people are thinking it's, it's just too uh, outrageous, uh, too messy, we should forget about it. Now, I want to say I think that's a fundamental mistake for two reasons, one pragmatic and the other theological. The pragmatic reason is this. It's a simple historical fact that political decisions have a huge impact, for good or bad, on literally billions of people around the world. Think of the devastation and death that the world might have avoided if German Christians had not helped elect Hitler in an open vote. Think of the freedom, the goodness, uh, the joy that followed for tens of millions from the fact that the evangelical politician William Wilberforce in the later 18th century labored over 30 years and eventually persuaded his colleagues in the British Parliament that they should end the slave trade and then end slavery itself. It's through politics that country after country has come to enjoy democracy. It's through politics that nation after nation has stopped jailing, quote, heretics and granted religious freedom. It's through politics that we develop laws that either restrain or permit abortion on demand, that allow or forbid gay marriage, that harm or empower the poor, that protect or destroy the environment. Politics is simply too important as a pragmatic reality for Christians to say, forget about it. But the theological reason for not doing that, I think, is even more important. Our central Christian confession is that Jesus Christ is Lord, Lord of the entire universe. 
The New Testament explicitly teaches in Revelation 1-5 that he is now ruler of the kings of the earth. Now, it doesn't exactly look like it as you look around, but that's what we believe. All authority in heaven and earth, Jesus has said, belongs to him. For Christians who know that, submitting every corner of our lives to this wonderful Lord is essential. And since we live in a democratic society where our vote or our failure to vote decides what happens in politics, we have to figure out what it means to have Christ as Lord as we do our political engagement, as we do our voting. So how do we do our politics in a faithful way that's faithful to Christ and deeply biblical? Is there an approach, a framework? I want to suggest that um, I think there is an approach uh, that's um, significant. Uh, this is a short version of my book, Just Politics, uh, which develops all of this in a much uh, greater length. And what I want to do in this lecture is, first of all, sketch my methodology for thinking about politics. And then second, I want to give you an outline of what I call a normative biblical framework. And then third, I'll sketch my political philosophy. And then a couple comments about recent developments in the evangelical world at the end. So a methodology. I think that any political decision that anybody makes really has four parts. Now, they may not think about it carefully, but in fact, those four parts are there. First of all, there's some kind of normative framework, some kind of basic assumptions about what justice means and who persons are and so on, some kind of normative framework. Second, there's some kind of study of the world. may not be very extensive, but there's some kind of study of the world. And then third, out of those two, there's some kind of implicit, at least, political philosophy. I'll illustrate that in a moment. And then finally, you apply that philosophy to actual situations. So more briefly, a little bit more extensively, those four parts. First, the normative framework. Everybody's political judgments are grounded finally in that person's deepest religious or philosophical commitments. Now there have been philosophers like John Rawls who've tried to argue that they have some neutral starting point which isn't grounded in any um, philosophical or religious commitments, but even Rawls has acknowledged that that's not true. And um, in fact, everybody grounds their political decisions on some kind of normative framework. Now I think that the best way to get a normative framework for a Christian is to go back to the Bible and ask, what does the Bible tell us about justice and the nature of persons and the poor, et cetera, et cetera? So we need a normative framework. And second, we need a broad study of the world. I haven't discovered any text in the Bible that says that um, nuclear reactors are the way to go in terms of um, energy, uh, yes or no, or uh, whether or not uh, a free market system is, you know, the biblical uh, economic arrangement, and on and on. One needs to study the world, study the economics, the politics, uh, the history of the world. And then we need a political philosophy. We need, what I want to do is take my normative framework and my careful study of the world and put that together in a political philosophy. Now, why do you need that? Well, for this reason. Every time you want to make a political decision, it's simply impossible to spend five years going back to the Bible and studying all the relevant biblical stuff, and another five years studying all the relevant economics and politics and history and so on. You need a handy roadmap, a handy guide, a framework. That's what a political philosophy is. But you daren't just adopt your political philosophy uncritically from some secular source. You need to get it from, on the one hand, a normative biblical framework, and on the other, a very careful study of the world. And then, of course, once you've got your political philosophy, you need to apply it. Whether or not you support this piece of legislation or not, or this candidate or not. So that's my methodology, those four pieces. One other introductory point before I go on to develop 
uh, my normative framework. And that's this. I think it's absolutely crucial <coughs> that Christians first develop their political agenda and their pro concrete proposals within the Christian community on the basis of Christian norms. If you don't do that, then you're almost certainly going to end up adopting secular norms and secular values and their corresponding secular political ideologies. And the result, if you do it that way, is going to be a compromised and fundamentally unchristian political engagement. Now, I think that's exactly <clears throat> what's happened in this country in the last 40 or 50 years. I think too many Christians have uncritically adopted either a left-wing or a right-wing political philosophy. The result, in my judgment, has been a sub-Christian religious right that I think was essentially right in championing the, championing, champion, in championing the family uh, and the sanctity of human life, but they largely neglected economic justice for the poor, uncritically endorsed American nationalism, largely, almost entirely, ignored environmental concerns, and neglected to struggle against racism. I think equally sub-Christian was a religious left that rightly defended justice and peace and the integrity of creation, but then largely forgot about the importance of the family and sexual integrity, sometimes uncritically endorsed Marxism and the sexual revolution, and certainly failed to defend the most vulnerable, the unborn. We must start within the Christian community with a normative biblical framework if we're not going to simply unconsciously adopt some secular ideology of left or right. Let me go on then now to illustrate for a little while uh, how I develop what I call this normative biblical framework. The basic set of values, norms that I want to shape my political thinking. And I start with what I call the biblical story. The true story from creation, fall, uh, the uh, whole history of salvation in the people of Israel and then in Jesus Christ, and finally Christ's return. That whole biblical story, I think, tells us a great deal that's important for our politics. It tells us that this entire created order is good and it's precious because it comes from the hand of a loving God. It tells us persons are created in the very image of God. We're called to a servant-like stewardship over the rest of what the Creator has given us. It also tells us that we've rebelled against God, and the result is selfish persons and twisted social relationships and twisted institutions in society and even a groaning, disordered creation. But God wasn't willing to leave us in that mess. <coughs> <clears throat> and so God started a long process of salvation. And at the center of that process is the incarnation of the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ becoming flesh, living among us, telling us how to live, dying for our sins, rising from the dead on the third day. History, we're told, is moving toward the time when Christ will return and finish his victory over evil and restore creation to what the Creator intended. So that biblical story provides a lot of our thinking about the nature of persons, the dignity of persons, the destiny of persons, the status of the non-human world, the importance of the historical process, and the ultimate meaning of everything. So that biblical story is one part of what I want to include in my normative biblical framework. The other part is what I call biblical paradigms. You don't need to worry about that word. It's just that I want to go back to the Bible and I want to ask, what does the Bible tell me about a whole bunch of things? The nature of justice, the nature of persons, the sanctity of human life, etc., cetera, et cetera. Let me develop those. And in each case, you know, to, to do this thoroughly, one would need to write a book and take five years just on the biblical uh, understanding of justice, and so on. But um, I'm just sketching this in, um, 
35, 40 minutes, and uh, even my book uh, is only uh, a couple hundred pages long. So my biblical paradigms, one, the special dignity and sanctity of every human being. Every person and only persons are made in the image of God. We're called to be stewards over the non-human creation. We're made so our fulfillment only happens when we're rightly related to God and our neighbor and the earth and ourself. And we're summoned in freedom to God's amazing invitation to salvation. Every person is invited to live forever with the creator of the universe. Now, what does that say about abortion? Well, it doesn't immediately uh, tell us anything about that. But I've come to the conclusion that we ought to act on the belief that from the moment of conception, we're dealing with human life. Now, there's no extended biblical passage that says that explicitly. In fact, there's no particular text that says it explicitly. But there are a number of texts that use words for the unborn that are normally applied to babies that are born. For 1,900 years, the Christian church was overwhelmingly opposed to abortion. Modern science tells us with astounding detail that from the moment of conception, we have a genetically distinct human being with a continuous biological development. There's no point of break, except for uh, uh, identical twins. Now, if one is uncertain whether this developing fetus is a human being, then I think you ought to adopt the assumption that it is, in fact, a human being. Why? Because to do anything else would be like shooting into a darkened theater with the justification that I hope I hit chairs and not people. So I start with the assumption that um, the sanctity of human life means that we uh, consider that from the moment of conception we're dealing with human life. That's one piece of my normative biblical framework. Another piece, freedom of belief. Throughout biblical history, God seems to be giving persons enormous freedom to respond to him in obedience or rebellion, unbelief or faith. Now, I know that the Old Testament doesn't uh, understand religious freedom the way we do uh, uh, under the First Amendment uh, in the US. Uh, people who blasphemed and so on were supposed to be executed. But there's also an amazing amount of religious freedom in the Old Testament. Again and again and again, God gives the people of Israel freedom to disobey him. And he punishes them, and he invites them back, and, and they have freedom again. Amazing. And when you come to Jesus, Jesus tells the parable of the wheat and the tares. And uh, you know somebody sows weeds in the field where the wheat had been sown, and the weeds come up too. And somebody asks, should we go and tear them out? And um, Jesus says, no, let them there until the end. And Jesus explicitly interprets that parable and says the field where the wheat and the tares are growing together, uh, it's not the church. It's not a parable against church discipline. The field is the world. So this is an amazing text that's a powerful statement about um, religious freedom. Third piece of my normative biblical framework, the family. Strong, stable families, persons related by blood or marriage or adoption, uh, I think is clearly essential in biblical teaching. Keeping our marriage vows, adopting God's design that sexual intercourse be reserved for a man and a woman in lifelong marriage covenant, valuing singles in the extended family. I think all of those things are important aspects of a biblical understanding of family. Or a fourth, I think it's four, uh, area, justice. I've got a whole chapter in the book on this, and uh, I'll be saying a little bit more about it in the second lecture. But there are two key Hebrew words for justice. They're mishpat and zedekah. You don't need to worry about <clears throat> those. The best translation is justice and righteousness. And it's very clear <coughs> that um, those two words for justice refer 
both to fair courts. The procedures must be fair. The courts must not be biased toward the rich or the poor. And they also talk about economic justice, about economic relationships that um, are fair. And in my second session this afternoon, I'll develop this further, but when you look at what happened to the land and the people of Israel, you see something quite amazing. The government didn't own it all, and a few rich people didn't own it all. Every family got their own land. And land was the basic capital, because that was an agricultural society. So land was the way that you created wealth and uh, cared for your family. And the prophets said that in the time of the kings, this arrangement where every family had their own land was being destroyed. A few powerful people around the king were seizing the land, and most of the poor people were losing their land. And the prophets said, God is so mad that he's going to send the nation into captivity. But they also say that sometime in the future, the Messiah will come. And when the Messiah comes, everyone, Micah, I think it's in Micah, who says this, everyone will have his own land and sit under his own vine and his own fig tree, and no one will make them afraid. They'll have their land back. So there's this basic principle of economic justice, that God wants every person in every family to have access to the productive resources so that if they act responsibly, they can earn their own way and be dignified members of society. A biblical paradigm, understanding of what justice is, is absolutely crucial if you're going to think carefully about politics. <coughs> a fifth area, a special concern for the poor. And again, I'll say more about this in the next lecture, but there are literally hundreds of verses in the Bible about God's special concern for the poor. One thing that the Bible makes clear is that God measures societies by what we do to the people on the bottom. A special concern for the poor is all through the Bible. Or a sixth area, work. I think work is essential to human dignity. We are called to be co-shapers of the world with God. Every able-bodied person has a responsibility to work. And I think society has an obligation to structure the world so that every person can work and earn a decent income. Or peacemaking, another piece of my normative framework. Christians look forward to the time when nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. But until the Lord returns, unfortunately, thank you so much. I was beginning to feel the need for that. <clears throat> until the Lord returns, sin will be around, and uh, there will probably be wars and rumors of wars. Many Christians believe that uh, the lesser of two evils is that Christians reluctantly engage in just wars for the sake of preserving the peace. Other Christians believe that killing is always contrary to Jesus. But whether or not you fall in the first or the second of those positions, all Christians agree that Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, and that Christians are supposed to love our enemies. So peacemaking has to be an important part of any Christian political framework. Another point, individuality and community. Biblical faith holds together, I think, both the inestimable value of every person and each person's freedom to shape their own life. That's the individual part of an understanding of persons. Every individual is called by God. Every individual is invited to live forever with the Lord. Jesus died for every person if they would accept him. The other part is we're made for community, and we don't find our fulfillment unless we're enjoying community, family in the larger society. Well, I could go on with other things, but that gives you a kind of quick sketch of how I try to go back to the Bible and develop a normative uh, political framework. Let me go on now to um, how I put that together, how I take my normative framework and do careful study of the world and arrive at a political philosophy. Now, the Bible does not have any section where it is labeled political philosophy, the way Aristotle would write about it, or, or any number of 
uh, political thinkers. But I think that if we take the normative framework and if we study the world carefully, we can come up with a responsible political philosophy. And here are some of the pieces of mine. And in every case, I'm trying to ground it in normative biblical framework and in careful study of the world. If you don't agree with my political philosophy, don't call me names. Just show me how I haven't done my biblical homework properly or how I haven't done my careful historical, political, economic, uh, and so on um, work carefully. My first um, part or the first uh, uh, piece of my political philosophy, decentralization of power. I think there's both a positive reason and a negative reason for decentralizing power. The positive reason is that every person is called to exercise her creation mandate and be a co-worker with God in shaping the world. Now, if all the decisions are made for just by just a few people at the top, then most of us can't fulfill this creation mandate. That's the positive reason. The negative reason is that power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely as the great British thinker Lord Acton said a long time ago. And it's precisely the biblical doctrine of sin that explains that. Sinful people in a fallen world will almost always use unchecked, centralized power for their own selfish, oppressive purposes. And so to avoid totalitarianism and to avoid injustice, we must decentralize power. Democracy is one way you do that. If you have one person, one vote, if you have freedom of speech, secret voting, universal suffrage, and so on, then you have decentralized power, at least in principle, in a wonderfully important way. If you separate the legislative and the administrative and the judicial functions, you decentralize power. When you have a central government and state governments and local governments, you decentralize power. <coughs> Democracy, I think, um, the Bible doesn't teach democracy, uh, but I think if you have a concern for human rights, if you have a concern for individual freedom, and if you have a concern to decentralize power, then you know, that points you in the direction, I think, of a democratic uh, political order. Another part of this decentralization of power is what I call non-governmental institutions or civil society. Non governmental institutions. In this society, we have a whole range of institutions in between the individual and the government. The family, the church, other religious institutions, the media, the schools, the economy, and a whole host of small voluntary organizations all through society. All of those organizations, independent largely of the government uh, and larger than just an isolated individual, all of those institutions provide a decentralization of power. They're intermediate centers of power. They check government and they provide an area where individual freedom can flourish. Another piece of my political philosophy, private ownership in a market economy. Now, as I told you, I'm sketching in broad strokes. This requires at least three or four books, but uh, in, in one minute or so, here's why I say that. I think the history of the 20th century has shown that when the state owns and controls most of the economy, then you put together economic power and political power. And when you do that, you have so centralized power that totalitarianism is almost guaranteed. When you have genuine private ownership of, of land and uh, other capital, that decentralizes power. It nurtures free individuals. It serves as a check on political power. When you determine prices and production by supply and demand, you discover that it's simply more efficient. You know, they, they actually had in Moscow, um, under the Soviet Union, they had an agency in Moscow that tried to set 25 million prices uh, and 25 million um, 
uh, decisions on how much to produce of each of those things. Now, nobody is wise enough to make that decision effectively and efficiently. The, the market, supply and demand, simply does that uh, more effectively. So I think that <clears throat> the two basic choices in my lifetime in terms of the economy was either a state-owned, state-controlled economy or a privately owned economy. And I have no doubt but that the, the second, private ownership, is the better way to go. But one needs to add one important uh, qualification. If you get huge privately owned corporations, then of course you get enormous centers of economic power. And if some of those very wealthy people also own the media, you get a further decentralizing of power. Somewhere around, uh, I don't know if it was February or March, uh, of this year, uh, a careful study disclosed that all of the money, and that not, not half of all the money given to all the political candidates of both parties running for president, one half of all of that came from 150 families. That's centralized power um, in spades, if I may use an evangelical phrase. So you can have concentrated power um, even within a market economy. I think a concern for justice and freedom demands a continuing vigilance against all forms of centralized power, economic and political. Uh, religious freedom, obviously, is another important part of my political philosophy. I won't say more about it. Uh, uh, family um, is another important part. Um, care for creation and a sustainable planet is another piece of my political philosophy. I think that flows from a biblical worldview. Uh, it's perfectly clear from the science that we face a long-term environmental crisis. Um, we've been destroying the natural world. Uh, now the science is overwhelmingly clear that um, global warming is happening and that uh, unless we get it, um, our carbon emissions uh, under control in the next uh, very few decades, we're going to face enormous catastrophic results. Of course, the people who will be hurt the most will be the poor, because the rich always have the resources to uh, protect themselves against um, any problem. What's the role of government? Well, I think government should restrain evil, but that's not the only thing it does. It also should promote the good. That's in the Romans 13 text, it's in other texts. Nurturing an economic, an economic order where everybody, especially the poorest, has the resources to earn a decent living, that's one central part of what good government does. Government's responsible for providing the legal and the social framework in which the other institutions in society can flourish. Government should carefully strengthen those other institutions when it does intervene and not destroy them. For example, some of our welfare legislation in the 60s and 70s and 80s uh, had the effect of undermining the family. What the government was trying to do was uh, assist poor people. But when it said that um, a family can't collect uh, any assistance if uh, there's no father in the home, <laughs> that just further destroyed the family. Uh, that's the kind of counterproductive thing that um, government uh, can sometimes do. Or uh, another piece of my political philosophy, work and workers. I've said work is essential to human dignity. And I think that means that every able-bodied person has a moral responsibility to work, uh, to earn uh, their living and support a family. I think it means equally that we have a moral responsibility to structure society so that every person can, who, who does work responsibly, can have a decent wage um, and have health care and care for their family. Workers have a right to safe working conditions, living wage, reasonable job security. I think the legal right of workers to organize unions is one way to decentralize power. Because if you have all the power in huge corporations and the workers have no way of counterbalancing that power, 
then they're almost certainly going to be oppressed. Unions provide some countervailing power. Now, of course, unions can use that power in unfair ways, too, just as big corporations do. And we have to work at that. The priority of the poor. I talked about that, uh, but I want to say a little more here in terms of my political philosophy. Uh, poverty has many causes. Some people are poor because they've been lazy or they've made bad decisions. Uh, and um, one needs to take that into account. Uh, some people are poor because the structures are unfair. The educational system in our big cities simply doesn't provide quality education for huge numbers of African Americans and Hispanics um, in our big cities. And so if God has a special concern for the poor, then any Christian political engagement must have a special concern to empower the poor. A couple more. A consistent ethic of life. I think the first and most basic human right is the inviolable right to life of every human being. And I've already said that I think um, abortion on demand is wrong. And I think we ought to, in fact, try to change the laws um, on this. Um, we need to work to protect the unborn. I think we also need to be working at a wide range of alternatives to abortion. Because we're dealing not with one person, but two, it's the baby and the mother. And the mother often has very, very <clears throat> terrifying circumstances facing her. So we need to have much more attention to how we can care and work with mothers, both in terms of private agencies and government policy that does a variety of things. I think euthanasia, the directly intended killing of the agent, is simply wrong. Now, that doesn't mean that one must accept every extraordinary medical treatment that uh, our technology now makes available. I think there's a clear distinction between allowing oneself to die and taking action that chooses to kill oneself. And that distinction is absolutely crucial. But a concern for the sanctity of human life doesn't end with abortion and euthanasia. Life doesn't begin at conception and end at birth. Tens of millions of people die unnecessarily every year of starvation and malnutrition and AIDS. And that's a pro-life issue. Tobacco kills about six million people every year around the world. And that's a pro-life issue. Last time I checked, capital punishment kills people made in the image of God. I agree with Pope Francis that we should protect the sanctity of human life wherever it's threatened and violated. Well, uh, I could go on, but that gives you a little snapshot of some of the important pieces of my political philosophy. Now, obviously, in order to decide who to vote for in any given situation or whether you oppose or support a proposed piece of legislation, you've got to apply that political philosophy to this specific issue. And that means you need to do some more homework and study the platform of the people and uh, their character and so on and decide how to apply that framework. Let me just end with a, uh, a few comments uh, about um, quite major changes in the evangelical world in the last uh, 30 years. What I've sketched, obviously, is what I call a completely pro-life agenda. I like to say I'm uh, pro-life and pro-poor, pro-family and pro-racial justice, uh, pro-sexual integrity and pro-peacemaking and pro-creation care. Well, that was not the whole agenda of evangelicals in the 80s and 90s, uh, and on after that, in fact. It was largely focused on uh, sexuality and marriage and abortion. What happened in the early 2000s was that the National Association of Evangelicals, uh, that's the largest network of evangelicals in the country, represents about 30 million evangelicals, they adopted a document in 2004 called For the Health of the Nation. And that document says that faithful evangelical 
political engagement and it must have a biblically balanced agenda. And the document has a strong statement against abortion and a strong statement on the importance of marriage and sexual integrity. But it, the longest statement is on economic justice. Uh, there's a very good statement on creation care, um, a good statement on peacemaking. And since that time, the National Association of Evangelicals has been working with Catholics and others on a whole range of things. Very good activity on immigration reform, uh, very strong stuff on economic um, empowerment of poor people, um, good statement on climate change, and so on. Significant uh, change. And in fact, with a lot of frequency, evangelicals have been working with Catholics. Because if you compare the NAE's statement for the health of the nation, which is now it's a unanimously adopted document for the, uh, the NAE, um, and they're working out of that in all their public policy work. If you compare that with Catholic um, social policy, the overlap is just amazingly strong. That's what I wanted to say by way of uh, getting uh, us started in terms of an evangelical political philosophy. Uh, tomorrow I will tell you how I think that applies to this election, but I, don't, I won't do that today. <coughs> Comments, uh, questions, what are your thoughts? Yes. I think Oh, oh, sure. Yeah, if I um, if I can raise what I think can be a bit of a thorny issue, and maybe a, a, a an observation that seems to me to not entirely resonate. Um, one issue that you you gave a lot of definition to um, sanctity of your life, you didn't give a lot of definition to family, um, and I wondered if you might do that. If if I could also follow that with, when I hear you describe the NEA's agreement with the RCC, that, and, and the varied issues that are being supported, that doesn't seem to jive with what I just sort of hear in the street from my Christian associations, or perhaps in media treatment of, of, of evangelicals. And I wonder, maybe I'm listening to the wrong news channel, or <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> It's the case that official Catholic statements are not always lived out faithfully by Catholics at the grassroots, uh, and it's equally true that not everybody in the 300, the three, uh, 30 million uh, members of denominations related to the the NAE, uh, you know, know about for the health of the nation. So, yep, you know, it's. Um, I think there's still quite a lot of truth that um, what I described as evangelical activity in the 80s and 90s one-sidedly concerned with, um, with abortion, sanctity of human life, and, and marriage issues. Uh, there's still a lot of that around. But what's important is that the, the evangelical center, if you will, uh, and, and the leadership is increasingly pro-life, pro-poor, pro-family, pro-racial justice, et cetera. The, there was another first part of your question, which was? I, I wonder if you might give something. You talked about family. But didn't oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, family. I did say a little bit about it. Um, you know, I, I think that, and I just published a book uh, with Ben Lowe, The Future of the Church, and my longest chapter is on the issue of homosexuality. Um, I think two things. One is that um, if the devil had designed a strategy for undermining the evangelical position on sexual integrity, he couldn't have done better than what we've done in the last 30 or so years. We didn't oppose gay bashing. We didn't uh, support kids in our churches who were struggling with their sexual identity. Um, we actually had leaders that said government should not spend money to find ways to help people with AIDS uh, you know, live. Uh, and on and on. Um, so we've, we've really, um, we've not led with love. We, we've not, um, by and large, we haven't been the people out there when, when AIDS was in the 80s, you know, primarily a gay um, uh, disease. Uh, we weren't leading the way on, on loving them and supporting them and walking with them until they died and, and so on. Although Ed Dobson uh, did that in wonderful ways in Grand Rapids. Uh, um, but I don't think we dare forget what the Bible says about sexuality. 
and the main thing the Bible says is that there's a wonderful gift from God. And every time the Bible talks about it, it says it's between a man and a woman and lifelong covenant. And that's what the church has believed for the centuries. And so what I plead with now for evangelicals to do is to remain faithful to the historic biblical um, teaching on this. Uh, you know, the 30-page statement on this is in, in my new book. Take a look if you, if you want that. But um, do it in a way that is loving and gracious and um, reaches out and interacts with people who are gay. Um, you know, there are wonderful evangelicals who say, I'm gay, but I don't believe God wants me to practice that, and, and so um, you know, I'll be celibate. Uh, that kind of person should be um, warmly embraced in the church. That per kind of person should be able, be able to be the minister or the head of the denomination. Uh, and we've got leagues to go before we get to any kind of genuine love and acceptance within a continued affirmation of what I think is the biblical teaching. That's kind of short statement of a very controversial topic. Other questions? Yeah. Can you speak loudly enough? Yeah. You said that um, often Christians do not have a carefully, uh, have it carefully reflected on politics with the assumption that if they did, um, we would get politics right. So uh, do you get politics right? Uh, why, of course. <laughs> I, I every week meet with a black pastor, um, white pastor, black pastor, we are evangelical, but politically we are, you know, very widely uh, different, divergent. And we both reflect, have careful reflection. Is it possible to, for the evangelical to really have a united front, it seems like we're just all over the map. Uh, I yeah. think there is some careful yeah. reflection, but my goodness. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's certainly true we are all over the map um, um, uh, at present. And uh, when you include the black church, which is uh, you know, which clearly evangelical, although they don't use that label because what, during the civil rights movement, uh, white evangelicals were against King, uh, and, uh, and um, you know, we've got a long, long history of, of pain there uh, and, and disobedience and unfaithfulness. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm not naive. I know we're all finite. We're limited. And so I don't assume that if we just listen to the Bible and do our careful economics, et cetera, homework, that it'll all easily fall in place and we'll all agree unanimously. I mean, I'm not that kind of naive person. But I do think that if we listen to each other more, if we had real dialogue between African Americans and white evangelicals, desperately urgent, um, then we would see some things that were missing, um, maybe both ways. Um, and um, I think that um, we really could make a lot more progress. So uh, I don't expect unanimity, but I, I expect that if we really together across the political divides that are there, uh, listen to the Bible and study the world together, we could in fact reach significantly more agreement. And one of the suggestions that I, I'm making in a piece that I just did for the National Association of Evangelicals is to say that uh, every Christian, every evangelical denomination um, this fall and um, I think regularly in election seasons ought to uh, organize a discussion group within the congregation uh, and have Democrats and Republicans and independents in it. And if everybody in the congregation is a Republican or maybe a Democrat, that Less, less likely, um, then, you know, uh, work with another congregation and model civil, respectful, vigorous dialogue on the issues. Every congregation could do that. The society desperately needs models of 
listening to each other. I mean, our politics is broken. We're in a dangerous situation. And um, we listen to different newscasts and, uh, and um, get our information from different places. And, and we're in deep trouble. So that the church ought to be an ideal place for modeling a new kind of respectful, vigorous civil discourse. Uh, yeah, um, I, I'm going to duck the first question completely because I'm going to talk about it um, uh, tomorrow. Um, um, uh, um, I actually, most European countries have systems of proportional representation um, whereby any party that gets at least 10%, the, the actual number may vary a bit, but there's some uh, minimal amount. Uh, that If you get 10% of the vote, then you get 10% of the seats uh, in Parliament. What that does is provide for a larger range of parties. Uh, it's politically impossible in any kind of short-term um, situation, like the next several decades, you know, to get that here, I would actually be in favor of that. If we did have that, I think the largest party would be an evangelical, Catholic, pro-life, pro-poor, pro-family, pro-racial justice, uh, pro-sexual integrity, pro-creation um, care, and so on, uh, party. Um, that's the, the central teaching of both Catholics and now with the NEs document uh, evangelicals. Uh, but um, since we don't have that, we're stuck with essentially a two-party system. And, um, you know, occasionally um, one party self-destructs. Yeah, that could happen. Um, and, you know, a new uh, party emerges. Um, I will talk about the wisdom this year of voting for a third party tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. In, it, um, as you're speaking to us tomorrow, s since I have to catch a plane in the morning and I won't hear it, <laughs> but uh, are you, uh, would you be guided more by the platform of that party or by the candidate? Um, because I think, as, as uh, John Perkins mentioned today, there's kind of uh, disgust with our candidates on both parties. Um, and, uh, so are you making your decision more on the platform that those parties are putting forward, or are, which is least obnoxious of a candidate? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it does come down to that sometimes. Um, I think that one needs to weigh both platform and what you think they'll really do, uh, which isn't always identical with the platform. Um, I mean, that's the issues. Uh, and then character. I and mean, character does matter. Um, I think both need to be weighed in evaluating candidates and how to vote. Um, I think that the more important issue is what you think they will really do, which is related to the platform. It's not unrelated to character. Um, but the really important issue is not whether a given person is, is, is nice or, or, or whatever, uh, but what will they do for the country? And 
Will they promote the kind of justice and peace and freedom, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera, that I was, I was talking about? And, and yes, um, I, mean, it, I mean, I always um, um, find it um, difficult uh, uh, to vote because Yeah. 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 The platform isn't decisive in that, but you know, uh, if you look at their track record and see what they have done, etc., you know, you get you know your best judgment on what they're likely to do right. and how that fits with a yeah. the whole biblical agenda that I talked about. Yeah. some reading uh, here lately, and it seems uh, uh, like Kenneth Collins over at Asbury Seminary is uh, saying that it's, it looks like evangelicals are going uh, more uh, to the left, uh, particularly in their voting and so forth. So I, I just want to get your yeah. opinion, where, where do you think, uh, you know, evangelicals, and then the other thing is, maybe you can talk a little bit about the definition of evangelical, because I think it's really changed quite a bit, and it's drawn itself out. Yeah. Yeah, well, it, it's certainly been the case that um, um, for a bunch of elections, um, people identified as white evangelicals have voted pretty overwhelmingly for the Republican candidate. Um, uh, with Bush and, um, and the two Obama elections, um, uh, it was somewhere between 79% and 75%. What's also true, I think, is that younger evangelicals um, are uh, becoming more deeply concerned with a broader range of issues, the environment, um, economic justice, um, and so on. Interestingly, they're, they're more conservative on abortion than their elders. Um, um, uh, on the issue of homosexuality, uh, it's the other way around. Um, but I think it's accurate to say that if you think of a religious right as being a Jerry Falwell and a Pat Robertson in the 80s and 90s, that the evangelical center no longer is committed to that kind of religious right. Um, there's a uh, leadership in the Christian colleges and universities, and Christianity Today, um, the National Association of Evangelicals, a whole range of organizations that I think um, um, the leadership there is moving very much to where the NAE's document for the health of the nation is. Yeah. Well, I think it's the responsibility of our pastors um, and our religious teachers uh, in the church to be biblical. You know, if, um, if, if our preachers were preaching half as much about the poor as the Bible does, you know, we would have some foundation for saying it's simply unbiblical, unchristian, immoral for Christians to be voting in terms of just what's in my economic self-interest. Uh, we have to be concerned about the community and especially about the poorer members of the society. So it, it starts, um, starts with our teachers, our preachers. When are we supposed to end this session?
at three. So we've got 10 more minutes. Uh, other questions, comments? Yeah. You know, I, I think you're right that that's important and that it's difficult to get at it. Um, I think the, you can get some modest insight by looking at the people who seem to be around them and, and, and shaping them. Um, the longer they have experience, you know, the more, probably the more information you have um, on that. Um, but I don't know that I have a good <laughs> answer to your question of, of how you get at that. You know, to the extent that you read, you know, serious commentary, political commentary, uh, in a variety of places, you'll get some information of that. Yes. The news said today that Pence was uh, Trump's vice president nominee, and he's been said by the news that he's an evangelical Christian. How much? Wait, do you think the vice president relates to the election? Well, I think in general, um, the vice president has only as much influence as the president wants that person to have. Uh, and so, uh, I mean, historically, the vice president has been very unimportant. Um, um, more recently, uh, they've been somewhat more important, but it depends. In, um, it seems to me that whether or not someone is an evangelical or a Catholic or an atheist or a Jew is essentially irrelevant for a Christian um, deciding how to vote. Uh, the question is, is that person's political philosophy and political commitments, and therefore the things that they will do, um, are they consistent with a biblically shaped political agenda that I've tried to develop? So, um, um, I mean, it would be a benefit for me if um, a, a person were an evangelical um, and from everything I could tell had a marvelous character of integrity and honesty and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and had the right political agenda. Uh, but uh, it seems to me, I mean, I would, I would clearly vote um, for a Jew um, whose political agenda fit with I, what I call this biblically balanced agenda over against an evangelical who had a very one-sided agenda, which is not to comment on Pence at the moment. <laughs> yes. A little, a little louder. You mentioned that the sources that we use to do our research have to be faithfully, I take this as a stewardship issue, who we vote for. What are the sources that you turn to that you think would help us to inform a biblically uh, informed political philosophy? Uh, Instead of having like only our ears in one news source or another, where would be some trustworthy sources that you would rely on? Yeah, if I understand your question, you're asking where do you go for reliable economic uh, analysis and political analysis and, and, and so on. And one of the problems is that, you know, we all used to listen to um, CBS Evening News and Walter Cronkite, uh, and, and now, you know, almost uh, CNBC and, and Fox News, you know, I don't know what the overlap is, but it's pretty modest. Um, so we're getting our information from different sources at, at that level, uh, and, and popular radio, and so on. So that, that's one of the problems. Uh, I think that what Christians need to do is, is try to read a variety of things, 
Uh, and uh, um, I mean, some newspapers are are more fair than others. Uh, I think public television's uh, six to seven o'clock uh, evening news uh, is often uh, quite balanced. They often have commentators from both sides uh, on an issue that really disagree. Um, in terms of economic policy, um, the uh, Center for Budget and Policy Priorities um, in Washington, it's Center for Budget and P Policy P Priorities, C CBPP, I think it is, uh, .org. Um, they are certainly not perceived as a right of center center, but everybody agrees that they do their economics analysis well. Uh, and very seldom you know, do they get that wrong. So that's one of the places I go for, for economic analysis of, say, tax proposals, um, budget proposals. They regularly do very careful analysis of, uh, of budget proposals that are coming out of the House and the Senate. And, and the president. I read the New York, New York Times um, daily. Um, it's obviously prejudiced in some ways, uh, disgustingly so, uh, on some issues. Uh, but uh, it has an awful lot of, 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 of factual analysis, factual stories. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. I. Um, I, I think that I would sort of make an observation, maybe hear reaction. I do think there have been instances where church has rather biblically thoughtfully reached conclusions in the past that we presently disagree with, be it the structure of the universe, the goodness of slavery, the role of women in society and church. And it seems that I find in my own congregational experience that to be able to talk, for example, about homosexuality and maybe what science is offering anew, what other biblical scholars are saying regarding passages, or other issues of controversy, it, it, almost, it feels like it's sort of forbidden speech. And I want forbidden speech. Uh, and I, I don't hear us on a congregational level talking about con very significantly controversial issues. And I wonder if you might have anything to say regarding that. So, I mean, there's no question that um, Christians have historically um, um, made claims and opposed new ideas uh, and then changed their minds. Um, I mean, Luther, Martin Luther, the great reformer, um, said of Copernicus, um, you know, the first major scientist to say that um, the earth goes around the sun rather than the other way, uh, that uh, he was stupid and it was unbiblical and you know, clearly wrong. And um, you know, the Catholic Church um, uh, made Galileo repent. Uh, now we all agree that the Bible was not intending to teach us the cosmology. Um, and uh, so one needs to be careful. Um, um, I'm a biblical feminist. Um, I, I think that uh, the most careful reading of what the Bible says um, about um, women is that um, they're um, in the image of God like men and that uh, they should be uh, el eligible for any role in the church and so on. Um, but it doesn't mean, the fact that we've made some of those mistakes doesn't mean that you automatically buy the new ideas. You have to do your really careful biblical analysis uh, and um, be humble about it. You know, I am very painfully aware of the fact that I'm finite, limited, I stand at a particular point in space and time, uh, and I might very well be wrong. Um, but I do my careful biblical analysis and my careful social analysis, and I dare to take a stand on the basis of that. Um, but at the same time, I want to respect people who are on the other side and keep listening and talking um, and um, hopefully learning. I think uh, our time's up, unless somebody has a very pressing question. Uh, thank you. Uh, in